afternoon. I'm Jennifer Shanker, Editor-in-Chief of The Innovator, and welcome to the session on threats to the internet. Um, now, we're really lucky to have uh, two great panelists here with us today. We have Matthew Prince, who is CEO and co-founder of Cloudflare, a public company that offers content delivery network services and cloud network infrastructure and security. The company's tagline is, we make the internet work the way it should. Nadav uh, Zafir is co-founder of Team 8, an Israeli venture capital firm, and prior to founding Team 8, he served as commander of Unit 8200, Israel's elite military unit, which is recognized as the informal talent incubator for the nation's tech industry. And uh, he established uh, the Israel Defense Forces Cyber Command. Now, threats to the internet are nothing new. Um, the possibility of internet fragmentation was first discussed in the 1990s before ICANN existed when the main transport protocol, TCP IP, and the domain name system were challenged by alternatives. In the late 1990s, the rise of private peering and the interests of telcos was said to threaten the emerging World Wide Web with internet balkanization. Before ICANN introduced internationalized domain names, there was a fear that the internet would fall apart along language lines. And in the 2000s, there was a serious discussion about whether the emerging internet of things would need a separate object naming system. Today, we're looking at some new threats and some serious ones. And uh, Matthew and Nadav are going to tell us about them. So Nadav, let me start with you. What do you see as the biggest threats to the internet today? Well, Jennifer, I think you, know, you, you need to zoom out for one second in order to talk about the future threat. Uh, if you all remember, perhaps most of the people in the crowd are too young to remember, but the internet was actually designated by DARPA as the unfailable, sort of the, the most resilient command and control infrastructure literally for nuclear wars with the Soviet Union. And in that sense, it's probably worked fabulously well, and I think the internet is probably as a command and control system, as, as, a, and as an infrastructure, uh, probably today more resilient than any other system and probably better than they expected. Um, but then in the 90s, we introduced it to the masses, um, and all of a sudden, uh, we said, wow, this is great. Now everybody could get access to data and you know, uh, consume data wherever they are, and we're democratizing data. We thought the world will become flat, and that was Internet 1.0. Then 9-11 happened, and we realized that you know, this beautiful thing that has been created also has the threat side. Fast forward 2007, Internet 2.0, smartphones, cloud, we all became prosumers, social networks, you know, we brought Athens to the world, awesome. And then we realized that, well, there's some threat that comes with that as well, because can we trust everything that's happening in this great new town hall um, that has globalized and democratized uh, everything? Um, and that created a trust issue that I think we're dealing with now. Looking ahead, I think there are three threats to the internet. Number one is just the same old trust, right? With AI, gen AI, et cetera, just imagine what bots can do, and, and, and at some point that could lead to the internet becoming so untrusted um, that we will go back to the 80s and get these enclaves or islands of trusted areas that we will need to verify and we will need to pay for it, just like the, you know, the, 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 the double click that we need to do in Twitter now, we need to pay for it, just to make sure that it's a real person, right? And that can take us back to the have and have nots. All of a sudden, only if you're in the right place at the right time with the right resources, the right education, you can actually trust what you're consuming and what you're producing into the internet. So that's threat number one. Threat number two, I think, is tech. Um, if you think about the next decade or so, if we get, for example, quantum computing emerging, uh, all of a sudden we're, we're, we have a threat to the encryption model of the internet. Without the, without the encryption model, the internet is for e-commerce, for example, becomes useless. And number three, I think, is a growth sort of threat to the internet, is just energy. 
We're already consuming about 10% of the world energy for compute, and it's rising very fast. Um, so I would say those are the three threats, um, and we haven't spoken about cyber. Okay, so Matthew, what's your take? You know, when, uh, when we first started talking about this panel, uh, I said it wouldn't be fun unless we actually got on a fight in stage. And, uh, and so it's great that I actually disagree with Nadav right out of the bat, um, which, uh, which, which is a good start to any, any panel. You know, I, I, I'll start with what is, I think, a miracle, which is that the internet exists at all. The fact that we've been able to connect people around the world, and the 40 years leading up to 2016, you know, I've been trying to figure out what a good metaphor uh, for them is, and, and, and I apologize for this being a very American metaphor, but it works surprisingly well around the world, which is, it's sort of like episode four of Star Wars, a new hope, right? There was this incredible thing, but instead of it being the force, it was the internet. Uh, there were these people that had special powers over it, but instead of being Jedi, they were developers and web administrators. And if you go back and actually watch that movie, it's a really bad movie. It's incredibly naive, it's incredibly simplistic. Somehow this person who has never flown a, a plane is able to close his eyes and blow up this massive force out there, which is the Death Star, and you know, take on the Empire. And yet that's exactly what the internet did. And it's hard to overstate how much a threat to traditional sources of power it's been, to government, to the media, to religion, to the family, all of those things, to education, all of those things have very much been threatened by the internet. And I think 2016 was this interesting turning point. Lots of things happened in 2016. Brexit happened in 2016. The Trump election happened in 2016. There were a lot of, of uh, conflicts across Asia in 2016. The thing that I point to is that in 2016, and this is again more cause than, or effect than cause, but in 2016, the Associated Press said we no longer had to capitalize the I in internet anymore. Uh -huh. And what I think that that represented as a turning point is it went from us thinking of this as a miracle to thinking as this is something that we just take for granted. Like electricity. And like electricity or whatever, and we don't, we don't capitalize that. But I think that that's actually a real risk. Because yes, there are real challenges around trust, there are real challenges around you know, things like quantum computing, but we can solve those at some level. I think that the bigger challenge is that those traditional sources of power are trying to put the internet back in the box. And after episode four of Star Wars was episode five, and that's The Empire Strikes Back. And it's a pretty dark movie. Um, hopefully, again, no spoilers, but you know, the protagonist falls in love with a girl that gets stolen away from the person he thinks is his best friend, who turns out doesn't even like the girl that much. The best friend, rogue best friend, gets encased in some plastic black stuff. The girl gets sold off to slug slavery. Meanwhile, the protagonist realizes that his, father, his, his mortal enemy is his father, loses his hand, and the, and the movie ends with everyone going in different directions, feeling very much alone. And unfortunately, I think that the next 40 years are going to be those fights, and it's going to be a very lonely time. And what we see in places like Russia right now, what we see in places like Iran, what we see when Turkey shuts the internet down ahead of its elections, that's the, those sources of power trying to put the internet back in the box, and I think that that's the thing that I'm the most worried about over the next 40 years. By the way, you're blacklisted in Russia, right? And why? Well, you know, I, um, so, in December of 2021, uh, we uh, started to see indicia of what were the early signs of what Russia does before they launch an attack. And unfortunately, Cloudflare has been around for 13 years, and we have seen Russia launch attacks in Georgia, we've seen Russia launch attacks in, in uh, Ukraine with Crimea in 2014, we've seen Russia launch attacks in Syria, and so we, we know what their fingerprints look like before they do that. And so we briefed Western officials and said, an attack is coming. And from December, mid-December of 2021, I, I felt a little bit like Chicken Little, saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling, but it wasn't actually. The good news was, that we were able to use that time in order to onboard a lot of uh, Ukrainian government and civil society organizations onto Cloudflare. A number of other tech companies like Microsoft and Google stepped up 
to protect their infrastructure as well. And so when, unfortunately, in February, February 24th of 2022, the Russian attack finally did come, we were able to help keep them online. And that pissed Russia off. Um, at the same time, we've been able to make sure that the Western media and the critics of Putin, like the Navalny Foundation, Bellingcat, can still be accessed by the average Russian citizen. And Cloudflare provides the technology to be able to do that. And we've created a real problem for Russia because they can't block us without blocking access to the APIs for the oil and gas markets that they need. But if they don't block us, then the Navalny Foundation and Bellingcat and others can talk about how corrupt the Putin regime was. And so, you know, I was, I was somewhat surprised um, where about a year ago, um, I, got, I got notice from our team saying that I'd been personally uh, sanctioned by Russia. Um, and, uh, and I actually think that's a badge of honor that we're doing the right thing. But, but make no mistake, Russia is trying right now to recreate ch what China already has. And China, you know, whatever you think about China, they were very, very smart in, at recognizing the threat that the internet had to their system of government and their regime. And they never let it out of the box. Other places, everywhere else on earth did. And right now the biggest fight on the internet is going to be whether Russia can recreate China, whether they can start filtering things the way that China does, whether Iran can do the same, whether Turkey can do the same, whether Egypt can do the same. And as that happens, I think that that's an enormous risk for the internet that you know, a lot of us have, have come to just expect to the extent that we feel comfortable not even capitalize it's the eye in it. What, what, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the, the discussion, there, there's been fear about the balkanization of the internet for a long time, and it hasn't happened. What is it about this current moment that makes you feel like maybe we're gonna go, tip the, the balance will be tipped? Well, I think, you know, the first thing is that I think the, that for very legitimate reasons, we are starting to see what some of Nadav described as the challenge of the internet. Um, you know, a lot of tech companies feel like they had a bait and switch where they, you thought you were the consumer, but really you were the product and they were selling your data. Um, a lot of uh, bad things have been able, enabled by technology. And, and so I think for some very good reasons, governments and organizations around the world are saying, well, maybe we need to put some controls in place. And, and I think that's exactly right. But I think as we do that, we have to be really careful. And so I'll give you a specific example. In um, Leipzig, Germany, uh, a few organization called Quad9, which is a DNS, it's an underlying infrastructure provider, got sued by Sony. Okay. And the suit was that Quad, they wanted to block Quad9 from letting you be able to get to some um, music pirate websites. Okay. And Quad9 has no relationship directly with the music pirate websites, but they provide core infrastructure, and so if they can block it there, then it will block it for a wide swath of Quad9 users. And the court in Leipzig said, we're going to do that. We're going to block that. And again, I think that the court in Leipzig has absolutely the right to do that. But the challenge was Sony came back and they said, well, the challenge is if you just block it in the jurisdiction around Leipzig, or even if you just block it in all of Germany, users can use VPNs right. and they can pretend like they're coming from Montana and they can still get to the pirated website. And so you need to not only block it in this area, but you need to block it around the entire world. And by the way, if you don't do that, the court said, you're going to face fines for us for every day and potentially even uh, criminal penalties. And so what do they do? And you might think, well, that's fine. You know, Germany, we're in France. Germany is sort of was all part of the European Union and maybe music piracy is bad. But if you look at what's going on in Montana, which is a state in the United States that actually has 10% more land mass than all of Germany, has about twice the population of Leipzig, right? So it's a tiny population, giant state. Um, they just banned TikTok, because they think TikTok is bad. 
again, you might agree, you might disagree, but by that exact same logic, a court in Montana can now ban TikTok globally because a Montana resident might be able to pretend that they're in Germany. And so I think re with really good intentions, almost like Jar Jar Binks sort of stumbling through the world, um, I think legislators and courts are doing exactly what the Russians and the, Ch and the, the Iranians and others would want to do, again, for good intentions. But what we need to be very careful of is that as we do correct some of the real problems that are out there, we make sure that we're not shutting down what has still, to me, been one of the incredible miracles, which is the internet. So Nadav, do you, what's a bigger threat to you? Is it, you know, government and the courts, or is it this, you know, lack of trust and on an ability, once we have deep fakes, um, you know, fueled by Gen AI, um, inability to discern the truth. Well, I, I think Matthew is right in the sense that the internet has changed everything. And I think internet 2.0 was about taking separate domains of our lives and doing what we used to call digital transformation, that is optimizing them, making them better, more secure, faster, et cetera. And it's worked wonderfully. I mean, look at uh, uh, COVID-19. Just imagine COVID-19 without the internet, right? COVID, all you have to do is go 100 years back uh, to 1918. And, but you know, the internet, if you'd have asked me before COVID-19, hey, this global epidemic is going to happen. 90% of the workforce is going to go home overnight and start doing these uh, video conferences over uh, these platforms, uh, and the world will continue running on that. I would tell you, Jennifer, look, you're naive. That's not going to happen. But the internet turned out, our digital infrastructure turned out to be much more you know, resilient than we anticipated. And that's great. And here we are after the pandemic. You know, a lot of good things happen. However, we're now entering what I call Internet 3.0, where it's not just taking separate domains of our lives and optimizing them through digital transformation. This is now transformation period, and everything is converging. And so the Internet becomes critical infrastructure, period. We're going to be running our energy on the Internet. Our hospitals run on the Internet. Everything is running on the Internet. And it's a complex situation. I mean, if you take the Russian situation, for example, what, what, do we, what do we know now for a fact? I mean, we suspected this for, for a long time, but now we know that in Russia, you can't really differentiate between state-sponsored cyber attacks, criminals, the whole thing is converging. And so this convergence creates, I think, a new uh, model where the threats are at a different level. So, you know, number one to your point is, what is the cost of all this if we need to now do what we call zero trust, right? So zero trust means, you know, the three of us just met this morning. We have some point of trust. Will that trust, and, and what was the cost of that trust? It was pretty minimal. What about 5, 10, 20 years from now, where we need to spend a lot just to get the minimal trust between each other, and so the cost of doing business rises dramatically. So that's number one. Number two, with the convergence of the physical and the cyber, you know, right after the war, if the Russians turn back at the, at the West or, the, or this deglobalization and polarization that we have right now, will, will our lights go out just like the Russians did in 2017 when they went after the finance industry in Ukraine, sort of as a cyber prelude to the very kinetic war that we have right now. And so, number one, trust. And I agree that we can solve that. Right? So, for example, we were chatting about this this morning. Uh, we have new forms of encryptions. For example, homomorphic encryption that's led by Professor Shafi Goldwasser, right? Um, these are sort of miracle new technologies that will enable us not to do zero trust, but to go beyond trust, right? We can also solve the convergence if we understand that this is a critical infrastructure and we need to look at OT and IoT and the connection between cyber and physical and look at everything in a holistic manner. I do think that governments have a role to play here. I think governments will need to uh, not just come with a stick, uh, but also with what are the expected outcomes and how can we incentivize organizations, enterprise, just like Matthew did in the war in Ukraine, just like Microsoft did in the war in Ukraine. 
leaders will have to choose sides in this in, in this new transformation that we're, the world is leading us into. So what's the scenario uh, looking forward? Let's say looking 10 years forward. What's what's the the dark scenario, and and what's a, what's a more positive one? I mean, and and how can the people in this room help contribute it to you know safeguarding the future of the internet? Yeah, you know, I think that um, again, in sort of the naive episode four version of of, of the internet. Um, it was sort of the internet was going to break down national boundaries and, and their governments wouldn't matter anymore. And it would, uh, th like, th that is a naive version. Governments still matter, courts still matter, the rule of law is still absolutely critical. And so the right answer is not ignore the courts. The right answer is not ignore the Leipzig court. But I do think some things are important. Rule of law matters, and, and what that means is that the people that a legislature, that a government, that a court can enforce should have a say in what that court does. And so Leipzig, the Leipzig court should be able to enforce an order inside Germany, and that's totally legitimate. But, and when they do that, they should be incredibly transparent about this, this particular site violates the laws of Germany, therefore you can't access it in Germany. Um, and if you don't like that, you as a citizen of Germany should be able to petition to do otherwise, um, and if we can defend that so there's a sovereign right of Germans to regulate what content is available in Germany, but, there, but it infringes on the sovereign rights of Poland and France and Canada and Thailand if all of a sudden that court does that for the entire rest of the world. I think that's the positive outcome that we can get to, which is a much closer relationship between governments and technology and an appreciation of fundamental principles of rule of law, transparency, consistency, accountability. The dark side is sort of the Teletubbies internet, which is that if all of a sudden every single jurisdiction around the world can say, I don't like this, so it's banned, all of a sudden we are going to fall to what the lowest common denominator is. And if you don't know it, Teletubbies is this inane t the t kids TV show but even that, you know, a, a, a pastor in South Carolina in the United States thought one of the characters on it was gay, so tried to get it banned. <sighs> so we may not even have that. And so I think the real long-term stable equilibrium is we have to have a respect for legislators. We have to have a respect for courts. We have to have a respect for governments. We have to understand that governments have the sovereign right to regulate the networks that are inside their borders but that their rules can't extend beyond that. And if we do that, then yeah, we might, the internet might look a little bit different in Germany than it does in France. It might look a little bit different in various places. And if we set a human rights floor that says, that's the case, but in Russia, we're gonna try and keep the lights on for journalists and reporters no matter what. I think that that's the stable equilibrium where we can address some of the concerns that Navad uh, rightly points out, but keep the miracle that the, is the internet. And my one ask for everyone is, if you care about the internet, if you make your livelihood using the internet, capitalize the I in internet, because it's one simple act of rebellion that can show that you actually want there to be one internet, that it's still a miracle, and that it's incredible that it brings us together today. Thanks, Matthew. Nedav, um, you, you have the last word. T tell us what you see as you know, a potential positive scenario and what can the people in the room do? Look, for, for the innovators in the room, um, in order to avoid the dark side, I, I agree that a splinternet or a balkanization of the internet is bad for all of us. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's, it may be inevitable, but there's still a large pool of people that will be a part of the internet with a capital I, as Matthew said. In order to keep that internet with a capital I alive, we, it's, not, it's not just about data residency, it's also about morals. And we as individuals, uh, leaders of companies, doesn't matter if it's startups or the incumbents, will need to create a moral ground for the, for the internet to actually remain somewhere where we have a minimum amount of trust. Uh, it's never gonna be perfect. Uh, but I agree, we need to keep the lights up because uh, we don't want to go back to pre-internet days. Okay, thank you. And with that, could we please have a nice round of applause for Matthew and Nada? Thank you.